Then, off to the west, the spires of Atlanta, ringed by almost 12 miles of fortifications. The Gate City on this July day of 1864, a strategic supply center, numbers 10,000 inhabitants, many still in residence, anxiously peering eastward toward the lines of battle and out along the Georgia Railroad stretching toward Augusta. In the distance stands the little White House of Mrs. Pope, a widow, with the Atlanta Decatur Road, now DeKalb Avenue, running nearby. <laughs> On this particular day, the storm of battle finds its eye in and around this brick house belonging to Troop Earth. Till mid-afternoon, nearly all the fighting had raged south of the railroad. But at this time, the daring Confederate success of the day is scored here by an assault of Major General B.F. Cheatham's division of Hardee's Army Corps, breaking the Federal line alongside this very house. The flag hanging from a tree in the yard shows what had been throughout the morning a federal signal station. Here, behind hastily thrown up logs and cotton bales, the South Carolina boys of Manigault's brigade are shooting it out with an already counter-attacking federal. The acrid puffs of gun smoke like swarming insects seem to intensify the sweltering afternoon heat. Just to the rear of this Confederate salient stand five cast iron guns left there by the Federal troops commanded by Captain DeGress. But the South Carolinians could not remove these guns because almost all the battery horses had been shot by the retreating forces. Here they lie, dying and dead amid the battery's caissons. Beside the broken picket fence reclines the broken body of a young soldier. Answering his cry for water, another young soldier bends over him. Mortal enemies and blood brothers. The fallen Confederate and the ministering Federal are the Martin brothers of Tennessee. The blue-coated infantry, their torn flags aloft, steadily firing, are surging back to help their fallen comrades restore their lives. Afar on the horizon is Kennesaw Mountain, which the Confederates had been forced to abandon only a few weeks earlier, after they had there held the Yankees at bay for almost a month. fighting its way back toward the third house, Colonel August Mercy, is being carried across the narrow bridge moments after his horse was killed, he himself severely wounded. His lieutenant glances back at his fallen leader, while upward toward the crest of this hillside, a section now known as Copen Hill, astride his horse, the commanding general of the three federal armies storming Atlanta, the red-haired William Tecumseh Sherman, scans the vast scene of mortal fury. This frame house, the plantation home of Augustus Hurt, brother of Troop Hurt, had since the morning of this day been serving as General Sherman's headquarters. The body of James B. McPherson, one of Sherman's generals, lies in this flag-draped ambulance. Shot from his horse by skirmishers a few hours earlier, McPherson lies dead at age 35 a classmate of his and a boyhood friend, General Hood, commander of the opposing Confederate armies, declared, no soldier fell in the enemy's ranks whose loss caused me equal to regret. Another fallen commander on this day's field of battle is Confederate Major General W.H.T. Walker, also shot from his horse about noontime by Federal pickets. But in all parts of the battlefield, lie the slain of both sides, of all ranks. Everywhere, comrades spring forward to replace him as he is on his black charger. Major General John A. Jones, as his father was first his armor, to spur on the resurgent troops of the Middle East. Immediately behind him, revolver in his hand, rides the hapless commander of the repelled battle.
Captain Captain De Grace. Other officers of Logan's staff follow at the ready. In this ambulance, also wending toward Sherman's headquarters, reclines Brigadier General M. F. Force, shot through the face of Leggett's hill. Consoling him and leading his horse is the General's son. Many luckily unscathed soldiers fall victims to battle fatigue. Others on this furious July day are overcome by heat prostration. The outstretched wings high overhead are those of old age. The War Eagle, battle-seasoned mascot of a Wisconsin regiment. Here he circles above one of the 42 battles of his stormy career. Dominating the horizon to the east looms Stone Mountain, its dome visible above the trees, and the gun smoke from a sudden skirmish in the Decatur Public Square. The torn up tracks of the Georgia Railroad provide an exhibit of a Sherman necktie, an iron track after it had been heated in bonfires of railroad ties and then twisted about the trunks of trees. These ties symbolize the Atlanta campaign because from beginning to end, it was fundamentally a railroad campaign. Brigadier General J.A.J. Lightburn, on a sorrel horse, leads his division back toward the troop hurt house where its line had been broken. In dogged advance, pushing to regain their earlier position, General Lightburn and his men, bearing old glory, will eventually sweep across the Georgia wheat fields to the hurt house as shadows begin to lengthen in the failing afternoon of what for many of them will be their final hour. In full gallop, the Illinois and Iowa battles rush to the support of the 4th Division under the command of Brigadier General William Howe. Steed, Colonel Warner, Inspector General on Sherman's staff, views a fallen officer lying supine in the gully. At the Colonel's left is Captain Frederick Whitehead of Logan's staff. Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith receives a report from Colonel Wells S. Jones of the 53rd Ohio that General Lightburn, in person, is leading his division forward. stars and royal blue bars on a field of blood red, the lads from Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee are pressing toward the edge of the wood as if to demonstrate what their leader, General Robert E. Lee, once said of these troops. They were asked for more than should have been expected from them. Three Confederate divisions are striving against overwhelming odds to regain this high hill, now known as Leggett's Hill. Only the old muzzle-loading guns, bayonets, and artillery made up the arsenal of weapons during the war between the states. Yet with such few weapons, the casualties of these bitter four years were staggered, as they were here at Leggett's Hill, with assault after assault being repaired, and the slope soon becoming mound in the slave. And the victims were the young men of America, farmers for the most part, 
from the South and the North. After all the contentious words of their statesmen had been spoken, finally their life was spoken. They are the youth. They are the swing. Courageously flinging themselves from entrenched lines, Confederate troops descend the slope, bullets flying from their thinning gray ranks. One of their couriers, his horse getting out of hand, has driven well beside the Federal line and has become a ready target for bandits and bullets. Whatever his message, it will not be delivered. Whatever his charge, it will not be met. So die many hopes, many dreams this day. So ends a battle, so perishes a cause. When the evening sun went down on this long summer day, the Confederate troops again retired to the Atlanta fortifications. Fighting defensively, as they had been forced to do throughout the battle, the Federal troops had not been dislodged from their ever-tightening lines about Atlanta. July 22, 1864, proved to be not the deciding date of the Atlanta campaign, but it presaged all too certainly the end not far distant. The very next day, cannon shells began to fall over the doomed city. Five days later, Hood's forces unsuccessfully opposed the enemy at Ezra Church. At the last battle fought for Atlanta, the defenders at Jonesboro failed again. On September the 2nd, Sherman's army entered the heart of the Confederacy. 